moving to the state house. But Indigo board member Mark Fisher says the amendment could put several projects at risk. In the infrastructure improvements, the sidewalks, the drainage, the repaving of the streets, uh, the, the redevelopment potential, all of that is at risk. I really hate that it's come to this point, um, but if that means that it's going to save a whole lot of businesses through here, then we'll just have to work on ways to improve the infrastructure uh, in the future. At least we'll still be here and be able to survive it. Working for you in Indianapolis, Cornelius Hawker, RTV6. The bill, including the new amendment, still needs to be approved by the Senate and the House. We'll let you know when the final vote takes place. RTV6 is keeping track of another amendment introduced just this week that would undo measures passed by the Indianapolis City County Council. If the bill is attached to passes, the amendment would prevent local governments from regulating major parts of the relationship between landlords and their tenants. The amendment was approved just hours before the Council approved two ordinances related to predatory landlords. Kevin, we have all been bundling up these past couple of days, and there's still some snow flurries out there, but there is a light at the end of this tunnel, yeah. this cold tunnel. Snow and 50 degree temperatures don't mix, so we've got to wait for that. But 30s definitely goes with snow, and that's what we have now, 33 and some light snow in Indy. Three headlines for tomorrow. Snow showers will redevelop. Temperatures way below average and we'll have a cold west wind 10 to 15 miles per hour. Northern half of the state not much happening. From Indy south we have these snow showers. The main impact with the temperatures cold it's a fluffy dry snow. You could get a quick cover. You'll definitely notice changes in the visibility. This will happen again I think tomorrow during the afternoon hours. This is what awaits in the morning. These are wind chill temperatures single digits in spots to the low teens elsewhere. Hourly forecast tomorrow will make our move to 28 by noon. Afternoon high temperature in the lower 30s will be nearly 30 degrees warmer. I'll tell you when in the seven day forecast coming up. We'll see you soon, Kevin. Thank you. Now to the latest on the fight against the coronavirus. Health officials are retracing the steps of a California woman diagnosed with the disease. She's believed to be the first person in the U.S. to contract the virus without traveling internationally or being in close contact with anyone who had it. Here in Indiana, the state health commissioner is sharing this message for Hoosiers. There are many questions for which we don't have the answers, but I am confident that Indiana is ready if and when this outbreak reaches our state. Today, Dr. Christina Bach said that Indiana is ready to respond to a coronavirus outbreak or any other pandemic. The health department says it's working with state, local, and federal partners to refine its strategies. Dr. Box is encouraging education, not panic. People ask me, is this time to panic? No, it's the time to plan. It's the time to make sure that, number one, that you educate yourself and you keep yourself informed. And, and I'm not talking about looking at social media and blogs that people put out there. I, I'm talking about going to ISDH's website or the CDC's website and keeping up with that accurate information that we want you to have. Coronavirus symptoms include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. If you have a recent history of travel to China or contact with someone suspected of having the illness, you can call this number 317-233-7125 for guidance. The outbreak is leading to a shortage of some medical supplies. Stores like Kroger, CVS, and Walmart usually have shelves full of face masks, but now they're empty. The Indiana companies that supply things like face masks and respirators can't keep up with the demand. I was in a meeting last week where I had a customer that typically would buy a couple hundred a month. You know, they, for their, their corporation wide, they, they, they were going to give me an order right there on the spot for one million masks. I couldn't do it. Didn't have them, didn't have the access to them. The president of the company, Haggard and Stocking, says the focus right now is on filling orders for customers they have contracts with. The coronavirus outbreak is also causing panic on Wall Street. The world will be watching the stock market tomorrow, hoping for a big rebound. Today, the Dow sank nearly 1,200 points. That is the biggest one-day drop in history since Monday. It has dropped nearly 3,200 points. Bob Phillips with Spectrum Management Group says this is not unprecedented. If you go back to the prior uh, epidemics that I uh, mentioned, so whether it's SARS, or MERS or HIV. There's probably 10 or 12 of those over the last 40 or so years. The market tended to react negatively initially, but within six months, I think it was positive um, every, every time. 
Phillips says this does not really compare to the 2008 financial crisis and a recession is not likely. And you can find extensive coverage of the coronavirus, including how it spreads and how to protect yourself. And the latest on the outbreak in a special section on our website, theindychannel.com slash coronavirus. A teenager who wanted to change his guilty plea in a high profile murder case is instead scheduled to be sentenced two weeks from today. Today, a Marion County judge denied Devon Seat's request to withdraw his guilty plea in the murder of Dr. Kevin Rogers. The 19 year old surprised the courtroom earlier this month when he made the request at his original sentencing hearing. Last month, Seat signed a plea agreement admitting to breaking into Dr. Rogers' home on the Northwest side in 2017 and killing him. There are many unanswered questions tonight after a homicide on the northwest side of Indianapolis. Police say they found the victim dead just before 4 o'clock this afternoon on Eagles Watch Drive near 56th and I-465. That's just south of Eagle Creek Park. Police say the victim appears to be an adult, but they're still investigating this. The Indiana Department of Education is taking steps to suspend the teaching licenses of three educators in Hendricks County. Today, IDOE filed complaints against Tri-West High School Dean of Students Stacy Begley, Athletic Director Nathan Begley, and former Principal Adam Benner. The complaints accused them of failing to report an alleged inappropriate relationship between a teacher and student to the Department of Child Services or police. The state wants to suspend the Begley's licenses for two years and Benner's license for three years. The Begley's are still working at Tri-West. Benner resigned in June. Cleanup continues one week after a crash. An explosion sent jet fuel leaking into some Indianapolis waterways. What environmental officials tell RTV6 about the process? If we've learned anything, this Big Ten season is at home is where the winds are. And it happened once again tonight. And Purdue does it again against the Hoosiers here. A little different than the first time, but the result's just the same. We'll have all the action covered for you. Complete coverage coming up on RTV6. A Dream Mattress Studio at Value City Furniture. This is RTV6 News at 11. Working for you. We have new information tonight on the efforts to clean up jet fuel that seeped into Indianapolis waterways. The fuel came from a tanker that crashed and exploded last week on the I-465 ramp to I-70 on the east side. The Indiana Department of Environmental Management tells our TV6 contractors are working 24 hours a day to clean up that spill. IDEM says that it's overseeing the process along with the Marion County Public Health Department. The cleanup may take weeks. This year's election marks 100 years since women were granted the right to make their voices heard at the polls. And tonight, the Indiana History Center hosted an event in honor of the 19th Amendment. The celebration included food, drinks, tour exhibits, and speakers. Passed in 1920, the 19th Amendment prohibits states and the federal government from denying a person the right to vote on the basis of sex. Organizers say tonight's event served as a way to celebrate the historic achievements of women and bring women together. Women have come a long way in history. You know, they've they've fought you know fought the fight and, and for rights and whether it's to to vote or or equal you know pay and, and things like that. And but then notoriously too, you know, women have had somewhat of an uphill battle. Um, so we want women to come together to help one another, not work against each other. More than 300 people attended this sold out event. A blizzard warning in other parts of the country is not stopping some people from enjoying their snowmobiles. This is Barnes Corners, New York. That warning is in effect in the eastern Lake Ontario region through tomorrow afternoon. It looks, looks like, like a white out there. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. So you think back to the blizzard of 78 in Indiana. It was the scene of snowmobiles on Meridian Street. Not stop, right? 465 that's just so unusual that sticks in your mind. Uh, have you ever been on a snowmobile? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. I've been on once and I jumped off. The guy was driving like a man. <laughs> I'm out of here. That doesn't sound safe either. Northern half of the state, just a couple of flurries. Southern half of the state, more substantial snow showers. No blizzard here. Temperatures too warm. Visibility too good. And the snow lacking. These are snow showers that will redevelop again during the day tomorrow. Okay. Temperature trend. Pretty obvious here. Follow the scale. Get above 50 degrees as we get into early next week. And actually, it's going to take place on Sunday. We're cold tomorrow. 
next 24 hours. Wake up Saturday morning to cold temperatures and then we rocket up into the 50s on Sunday. That is quite a change Saturday to Sunday. The best thing I can say as well is it will be dry Sunday because the mild temperatures Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday will come with some rain. Get back to the work week 55 with rain likely on Monday. It's too early to say exactly, but some of the rain could be heavy, especially in the southern half or southern third of the state. 55 still on Tuesday. We're a little cooler on Wednesday, but still above average for this time of the year in the middle of next week. Tomorrow morning at the bus stop in the teens, that's the actual temperature. As I mentioned off the top of the newscast, we'll have some single digit wind chill temperatures. Winds tomorrow not as strong and the snow showers will develop again, especially southern half of the state during the afternoon hours. Temperatures struggle to hit freezing. One o'clock cloud cover reasserts itself. We could have some morning sunshine, but then clouds increase. Then you begin to see the snow showers from Crawfordsville to Indy to Greensburg south at four o'clock, seven o'clock, still some ongoing snow showers. Those will be pushed out of here when we start getting warmer temperatures to come back over the weekend. 27 at noon tomorrow afternoon, high temperature uh, just below the freezing mark. Temperatures over the weekend take that big jump, as I mentioned. Saturday, lots of sunshine. That'll be nice because we start cold. Temperatures warm to 37 for the afternoon high. These are below average, but we fix all of that on Sunday thanks to a strong southwest wind that will gust at 20 miles per hour. Temperature just short of 60 degrees. That's another positive way of saying that. 57, the anticipated high temperature. Rain through Tuesday night, a good soaking widespread rain expected where the heaviest rain will show up is still in doubt but the ground is pretty moist, so I do think that will aggravate some flooding situation. As you look at the seven-day planter, there's your wet start to early next week. Even when we cool down, it's not a shot of Arctic air. Just puts us back in the 40s for highs and 30s for lows. Looking forward to those 50s. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> Thanks, I think we all that. are at this point. All right, Dave and Brad, join us now. Hey, guys. Guys, another crazy IU-Purdue basketball game here at Mackey Arena. You go back a couple of weeks ago when Purdue defeated IU by 12. The two teams went in completely different directions since then. Purdue had lost four in a row. IU had won three of the last four. You thought the Hoosiers might have the advantage of this one, and then they tipped it off. Purdue played like a team that was desperate at the end of the season right, right here. They played like a team at home as well. It came out they just had more fight in this game. This was like old-school Purdue in this one, down and dirty. There were some finer points in this, including IU with a couple of massive scoring droughts. In this. Now they shot 0 for 13 during a nine-minute stretch in the first half, followed that by not hitting a field goal in a 10-minute stretch. What's going on here? Now, Purdue got going on in spectacular fashion, a couple of really nice pick-and-roll plays. And guess what? Trevion Williams was up to the task. Yeah, he really was. Was very much the best player in this game. Now, here's the deal. As bad as IU's droughts were, they never got down by more right. than 15 points in this game and stayed in it into the second half. Until the second half, Purdue's lead grew to 18 during that last drought. IU answered a 10-2 run and got back into it. Race Thompson really getting the lead down to six, but again, all told, the Hoosiers shot just 26%, and Trace Jackson Davis just six points in this game tonight. And ultimately, Purdue just made the plays. Both ends of the floor had themselves in the right spot. Final score when it was done, 57-49. Boilers get one that they needed. Anytime you could, you know, put a stretch together scoring in a game like this, um, you know, it's going to benefit you. Uh, I, I thought their inability to score the start of the second half and our ability to increase the lead at the end of the first half was, was really uh, was big, especially how we played in that last four or five minutes of the game. For me, it was, it was a lot of emotion, <coughs> I would say. Uh, you probably couldn't tell that much, but um, I mean, three games left, trying to make the tournament, it's a rival game. But it, it, was just, it was just a lot of stuff that went into that, and we really wanted it. As mentioned, Trace Jackson Davis, pretty ineffective. Devontae Green, he was off for most of the night. And then Travion Williams. I mean, outside of Joey Brunk, no one could defend Travion Williams in a show. They really tried everything that they had. They oh, tried yeah. it with Jackson Davis. They tried it with Ray Thompson. Justin Smith got a hand in there. But Big 50 for Purdue certainly had to go tonight. Travion Williams, I give him credit. You know, when they needed it the most, he stepped up and got them baskets, and he was able to get some key second shots at times when we even got the first time stop. But he was a handful tonight. Very, very hard fought game. I thought those guys defended really well, in particular in the paint, made it very, very difficult for us um, around the rim. 
the post doubles, you know, continue to sort of take a big guys out of the game. And, uh, you know, our inability to sort of stretch the floor and make some shots, you know, was a problem. Question is, what does it do for the postseason? IU, if they would have won this game, that would have been a huge road victory. Still, though, Purdue, they got exactly what they needed out of this thing. Must win all the way up for Purdue to have any shot at March. IU feels like a bubble team right now. Maybe one of those last four in. We'll see. Both of these teams need another win this weekend. And both are on the road next game up. Brad Brown, day first. Another wild with IU-Purdue here at Mackey Arena. Thank you guys, and coming up, you don't have to work in a hospital or clinic to play an important role in the healthcare system. What it takes to be part of IU Health's talent acquisition team. Long John Silvers. Hoosiers is connecting you to in-demand jobs, and there's a big need for healthcare workers right now, including nurses. If you are an aspiring nurse, there's a new education option in central Indiana. Hondras College of Nursing plans to open a new campus in Indianapolis in the pyramids on the northwest side. Classes are set to start in April. Across the country, the nursing shortage will reach 200,000 by 2026, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The need for healthcare workers is so great, there's even a push to recruit people who do the recruiting. I found out those employees play a critical role in finding the talented doctors, nurses, and others who help you at your most vulnerable. These positions at IU Health are all about staffing the hospitals and clinics, recruiting and screening prospective candidates for all levels of personnel at IU Health, from entry level to skilled nurses, physicians, and even executives. I really was looking to grow in my nursing career. Nikki Beeman came to IU Health as a nurse and thought she'd spend her career caring for patients bedside. But she has learned there are other ways she can use her expertise as a nurse to care for patients. Even though I'm not in direct patient care, I still get to really bring in that nursing talent that does touch our patients and that do make a difference in our organization. And so that's very important to me. Nikki has spent the last three years helping to fill that gap when it comes to the nursing shortage in our area. She's a senior acquisition talent consultant, part of a team of 50 at IU Health, tasked with interviewing candidates, reviewing applications, and providing input and information to hiring managers. Going out and actively recruiting is part of the job too. The talent acquisition consultants use a number of avenues to get the word out to prospective candidates around the state. Nursing schools all around the state is a lot of our focus. We also do target experienced nurses on platforms like LinkedIn and Indeed because we do value experience as well. The talent acquisition team could use some extra new hires too, since at any given time there are roughly 2,000 openings at IU Health. First and foremost, it needs to be someone who loves people uh, because so much of the job is really interacting with candidates, um, with their peers, and with our, the hiring leaders that we support. Tanya Hahn heads up the team in charge of finding talent. She needs people who can be organized, comfortable with a fast pace, and able to juggle a full plate of assignments. We really see people on our team um, coming from a diverse range of backgrounds. Um, we have people from the hospitality industry. We have people people who actually started out in um, a healthcare clinical role and decided to make a move into um, you know, this back office function, if you will. A chance to be part of a team that is giving hospital new hires a chance to excel in patient care. It's different every day. That's what I really love about my job. Well, these open positions on the talent acquisition team may be ideal for people looking to make a career switch. For qualifications and salary information, go to HiringHoosiers.com. We'll be right back. 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. at Ashley Home Store. Temperatures in the teens tomorrow morning. I think we start with some sunshine. We'll pick up clouds as we go through the day, and then we get to stare at the thermometers. We get second half of the weekend and next week. I don't want to rub it in, but look at that. Look at that. Look yeah. at it. It's on Take the it way. In. Make plans. Wait. Now we just wait patiently. And live it up. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for RTV 6 News at 11. GMI starts at 4.30 a.m. Thanks for joining us.